Hello, everybody. Welcome to another show of Ahead of the Curve. Today, I've got a special guest, Laura Frank, with me, and we're going to be talking about this new community that's been built called Framework. So, Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, we're going to do this a little bit differently, seeing as it's pre-recorded. So those of you who are watching the video, if you have any questions that come up or, or that come to mind, please feel free to post those as comments inside of the, uh, the video. And we'll make sure to get back to you as soon as we possibly can um, once the video has been posted. So just wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of a heads up there. So Laura, can you tell me a little bit about, um, for the viewers that have not seen you before, a little bit about who you are? Um, kind of how you started in this crazy industry that we're in? Great. Um, it's really great to be on the show. So thank you for having me. Uh, I, you know, there are a couple of history is where you define the start of time. So we could talk about my educational experience, <laughs> my beginnings in New York City, uh, when I started with the moving lighting industry or when I made the shift into video. It, it's It's all how you want to see that evolution. Um, but I always like to talk a little bit about education because I feel like a kernel of what I do now started in high school when I was you know, trying to do something different. Like many people, I was attracted to theater, but I had a science bug and um, I, I, you know, numbers, technical things were very natural to me. I was fixing the wiring in my family home from the time I was eight. Like <laughs> these are just natural things I understood. Um, I was the person that could unplug and replug the broken object and make it magically work again. And make um, it work, so... magically come reappear again. <laughs> exactly, I could turn it off and on and it would all be fine. <laughs> so um, in high school, I started exploring physics. I read, wow, this, I'm going way back. Um, I read the Dancing Lily Masters and became enamored with particle physics. Um, and if, if you don't know the book, Gary Zukav, wonderful uh, look in, or journey into the philosophical side of science and um, science itself, physics itself. Um, so in college, I was like, I, I have to find a way to do physics and art. And um, I went to a very small school in Vermont with only 200 students. Unfortunately, it's closing this year. So I just want to give a Aww. shout out to my family at Marlboro College in Southern Vermont. Uh, this, they have just closed down, um, a victim of changing demographics and uh, just, yep. you know, boutique education. Um, I, but being in such a small environment, I was encouraged to uh, explore my own path. And I think spending four years in an academic environment where people were like, huh, that sounds interesting, go try that or go research that has really influenced my entire career. Um, so by engaging with the physics professor and the dance professor, after four years of undergraduate education, I walked out with a degree in theater and physics. <laughs> and it's one degree. And oh, it was one because degree. I was so in, it's in theater yeah. and physics? Yeah, That's Bachelor's it. of Art, Bachelor of Arts in theater and physics. Cool. And um, I, ha I ran a small dance company, I was choreographing, I was designing the lighting. Um, I probably had weak. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't have any traditional academic approach to the study of lighting design, to the study of modern dance, or the engineering of creating light, which was the physics portion of my academic time there. I, um, you know, I just found a textbook on illumination engineering, and I was like, huh, that sounds interesting. Let's that see what cool. that's about. And in the background, this was also when um, thin film technologies were being applied to uh, lamps and lighting fixtures to improve their efficiency. The technology that became the Source 4, ETC's Source 4. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I just, what engaged me, you know, was technology that was evolving. So when I finally broke out into the professional world, um, you know, to me, that that was what drew my attention. I was like, "What's the new shiny thing?" So I immediately was drawn into <laughs> moving lights. I think there's some common grounds there. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, but it was. We're great all because, attracted like, to shiny things. We are all attracted to shiny things and um, things that are new and evolving and riding that wave. I mean, 
ahead of the curve is, is a perfect example of like <laughs> where we all sit in this industry um, and why we love it so much and why we invest ourselves so deeply. So um, if you want to talk my about my background, it, it's really maybe just those basic character traits we all share um, of what we latch onto or what excites us about the work we do that in, engages us to work as hard as we do. Um, I can't think of a, a person I come across in this in this work that isn't just hyper motivated to keep lear learning, keep exploring new things. And so, you know, my career is, I couldn't explain it to you if you wanted to get started and meet <laughs> me where I am now, but I can tell you if, if you just follow what seems interesting and where the technology is going, it happens. Yeah, I, I think that we've all uh, we've we've definitely learned that lesson to to reiterate on on our on, on the drives of the typical person that you would find in our industry. Sometimes I think our drives might be a little bit too much, and yeah. we definitely exhaust ourselves. But it's 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 a it's a work of love and it's a work of passion. Yeah. Well, I remember feeling in my twenties getting started. This is so cool. I get to get paid to do. Um, interesting things that would be my hobbies anyway. And then at some point you realize uh, I'm working all the time because I'm getting paid to do the things that would be my hobbies. And <laughs> and so the reach becomes, how do, my, how do I make myself a more well-rounded, interesting person? I just can't be talking about moving lights and programming all the time. <laughs> I always say that I was suckered into this, this whole yes. session. Because I had a, a friend of mine when I was in high school, um, really good friend of mine, and his cousin was the technical director of the theater in our high school. And you know, I come from a really small, or I was raised in a really small French area of Quebec, Canada. And uh, you know, he asked me one weekend if I'd be willing to go into the theater and hang some lights with him. And you know, I was I think 15 at the time, and I was bored that weekend. I was like, yeah, sure, why the hell not? I'll come in and hang some lights with you. So he handed me a crescent wrench and you know, started having me run around and hanging lights and- You poor <laughs> man. Oh, no, boom. <laughs> Absolutely hooked, <laughs> 20 years in, tried to go and do a yeah. degree in, in computer sciences. Yeah, that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, my physics professor in college happened to love musical theater. So he, he was like, oh, you want to go hang out in the theater? Great. <laughs> like, Let's encourage this behavior. Yeah, go do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I personally, I know I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, it's yeah. it's been one hell of a ride uh, through so many different different gigs, different people, different, you know, over the years, it's just been, it's been a, an incredible journey. And being able to just come across all these wonderful people uh, from all over the world. I mean, there's, I, I try to sometimes imagine or think about, you know, other fields or other careers that are similar to ours, but I just can't think of any that are, you know, maybe yeah at least not for live entertainment. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. No, I see it. I see a lot of pa parallels in the restaurant industry. Um, I remember reading Anthony Bourdain's uh, Kitchen Confidential and just thinking, oh, there are more of us out there. <laughs> yeah. I guess I have to get my hands on that book. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, I want to ask you a question because I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about, which is when, when was there a moment in your career you were able to explain to either your parents or your extended family that you had a real job? You know what? I would honestly say that my my parents were very liberal and very open minded, and they were very supportive of of myself and my brothers. So, I I would honestly say that in a lot of ways I was very very fortunate, and um, you know they they never questioned it. I think they saw that I was just super passionate about it, and I was driving into it. And my first paying gig was actually for the school that I was attending. Um, mm. I, I ended up being hired in the, as an assistant technical director for the university theater. And I was going to school at the same time. So it just kind of naturally fell into place. And then I was like, okay, I've got to go to school and, and, uh, and, and do this professionally. So, you know, away I went and I was working while going to school at the same time. So it was, all, it was yeah. like basically a, just a natural, a natural, 
kind of progression. I, again, I think I was just very lucky in a lot of ways. So how about yourself? Um, I always tell the story about my grandfather who's still with me, my, my mother's father, he's 103. Um, the, all of my twenties, he was like, this is, you know, I tell him stories about work and he's like, this is cute, honey, but when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> and <laughs> he used to travel in, in the height of his career to New York city every year from San Antonio, Texas to the diamond district. Cause he had a jewelry business. And so New York held a special place in his heart. And it was when I worked on um, New Year's Eve in Times Square for the first time, you know, and I was probably moving on the, working on the moving light rig or maybe programming. And I just said, Grandpa, I, I lit the ball. I just, you know, I was trying to come up with a sound bite for him. And as soon as I could say that, he never asked me again when I was going to get a real job. <laughs> I lit the ball drop, you know. Yeah, I mean, how could you, yeah. How could you even go again? Like, I don't even know how you would be able to, to say anything to that. Yeah. All right. Hats off to you, babe. <laughs> Carry on. So let's let's dig a little bit into uh, into this new thing, into framework. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me what it's about, like what it's about, why it came to be, what you guys are doing? Um, Soren West and I, uh, probably four or five years ago, uh, were discussing the idea that it would be really great to have a group of people in our pocket of uh, production get together and talk. We, you know, we imagine this so many ways, but what we saw was a group of people working, you know, in this emerging field in production. And, you know, we were all in our little pockets, developing our own workflows, developing our own, um, uh, you know, process of, of production. And, and he is in, in his ex executive producer role and me leading a, a team on shows. We had seen this evolution over years of working together and just wanted to see like, if we brought the wider community together, together, what these conversations would be like, how we could focus the attention of this group of people into uh, a path forward that served all of us. And, and you know, it was gonna be like a think tank conference or a symposium um, ju just to, to keep a, a, you know, a hand on the heartbeat of, of where this industry was developing. And you can even see five years ago compared to now, I, I don't know we, that we'd be talking about the things that we're working in now. Um, it's true. Yeah. And then, um, then after NotchCon, I ended up having a conversation with Luke Malcolm about uh, that experience and what it was like talking to that community. And of of course, initially, the idea of framework, it didn't have a name yet, was largely about the production people who have to engage with um, collecting programming and getting content to screen. And, you know, obviously, I spent a lot of time talking to content creators and designers about uh, their process and making their workflow as efficient as possible and helping them realize their creative goals. But the mechanics and the operations side was really my seat and, and where I wanted to improve that conversation amongst my peers. Luke, in talking to the content teams, really saw the need for the designers and animators and motion graphics people to, you know, to engage with that same group of people as well. They themselves had their own um, pain points and issues um, in advancing their work and their creative practice and bringing that community together with the operations teams and programmers, engineers, that we as a community um, could really, it really help all of us advance our practice by coming together and talking about what it is we're actually doing. I mean, I can barely come up with a three word statement that puts us all in a similar bucket to describe what to do, it's, what we do. It's funny because I was trying to even figure out how do I describe this whole session? Like, how do I describe framework to the people yeah. about what it really is? And yeah. it's been really hard to come up with, <laughs> come up with, you know, terms to even put sentences together to really describe it. it it's it's just I, it's really pretty much impossible to put it all together in a few string it together in a few sentences. Yeah. Is it the screens community? 
Um, then JT will get mad at me because he says it's singular. It's the screen community. <laughs> oh, I use uh, live event uh, video scenic artists. Yeah. Um, Are you the technician backstage? Are you the yeah. systems engineer? Are you the media server programmer? Are you the content creator? Are you yeah. name, your, it's, it's, name your role here? Yeah, and, and to me, like the, there is no shorthand of terms, but what we do and what uh, the textbook I ended up writing before this finally got off the ground um, talks about is the idea there is a community of people responsible for uh, managing a pixel, a creative pixel, from design to output and all the handoff points in between, whether it's the animation, motion graphics team, designers who define what that pixel is and where they want it to go on the set to the scenic designers and um, where the screens are in the set to the programming and operations team describing where to put a pixel on a raster so it gets to the right point on a set to you know, the engineer is managing that signal flow and the communication of where that pixel is moving on all these signal streams. Mm -hmm. It's it's an incredibly large group of people, but you, we, video, we can't call ourselves the video production team. That implies a completely different community of people on most productions. Yeah. So scenic video artistry, because in a lot of ways, um, you know, scenic artists, uh, we're, we're absorbing a lot of their visual real estate in a production environment. And yeah. as- Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, when I started doing set design work, um, the one of the main core reasons why I ended up getting into video was, hey, we've got these video screens and they need to be placed somewhere. They need to be integrated somewhere. So yeah. that's you know kind of how it all started. Oh, well, I need to put a video screen here. I need to put a video screen here and design around it. And then next thing you know, you're like, well, I guess I should just design where the video screens go now, and and yep. integrate them into the set and, and integrate them into the scenery. And before that was a video screen, there was a conversation you'd have with an artist, your scenic artist, about how that flat was going to be painted, or yep. you know. So early on, I was definitely trying to engage with scenic designers because it was not a discipline I understood well um, coming from lighting and lighting design. Um, and I wanted to understand, okay, well, you've now given me this void. Uh, did you have an intent? I mean, when you, when you were doing, <laughs> right? The, the pitch rendering. What were you, you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna go that far. But uh, in the pitch renderings, that you know there was some kind of imagery placed on these surfaces do you want to engage with me about what's going there do you want to be part of the conversation with now this whole new team that used used to just do broadcast graphics and i'm going to speak mostly from broadcast because that's most of my experience of the last 10 years you know there is a graphics team that's been working on these shows forever that i suddenly started engaging with as a media server programmer that had style guides and um you know, creative directors and producers on their case about what was going on broadcast. And yet the stuff going on these scenic screens, it, th there was a huge disconnect between yeah. the broadcast graphics mm -hmm. and the scenic graphics. And so I would try and engage with whoever had access to this team, like, shouldn't the broadcast br graphics be on these new screens that are popping up? And how do we describe to them? Because you, now you're talking about a community of people that designs pixels for a flat space. And now I have to teach them about very basic scenic design elements of space and how the people in that space interact with the scenic art around them and not to upstage them and, and how to, you know, all the things we learn as theatrical designers, how to support what's happening on stage as opposed to how to visually be the most engaging thing you're looking at on a screen. It's a different way of thinking. It is definitely a different way of thinking. Um, I think it's also a lot to do with, you know, just general communication as well, and mm -hmm. having that having that communi that that link. Because um, I always say one of the most important parts of any company being successful is the way that they commun communicate internally and amongst each other, and the way that they pass information. And I think that same kind of um, ideology or fundamental applies to just about everything everywhere. Yeah. 
So, so in a lot of ways, I, I'll just to wrap that up. Um, framework is a, a lot about communication and community, because as we started getting some momentum around building this project, it was going to be a physical conference in October, and it, it was about bringing this community together, engaging with each other, communicating about our process to better inform each other about what it is we do. Because while we've all become um, known professionals in this part of the production community, my process as a screens producer might be very different to someone working in corporate work in the rock and roll touring industry. We needed to get together and compare notes about how we achieve what we do, where we want to improve our work. You know, when when a client calls me and I can't do a project, I can't necessarily recommend someone for for exactly what they might need unless I know well what their process is and and how they like to work. So my client is familiar. Like, no, I didn't want to create like a fixed standards and practice for what we do. I just wanted yeah. to be more aware. I don't think and, there. I don't think you can actually create like I. I don't think you can create a fixed practice. At least nothing yeah. that could cross all the different market segments that we work in. You know, right. if if you're if you're building um, a community that's based around all these different market segments, then it's going to be really difficult to establish that. But but we can have more clarity to say like, well, my working style is more similar to so and so, and they might be a good fit. When I hear a client describe a project to me, that I might know more fundamentally like who might be a good fit for something. Um, we can have more clarity in the language that we use uh, with our clients, so that they're, and we need to educate our clients so they so that we're not some magical black box or group behind black drapes in the corner that, you know, content comes in, magic comes out, and they don't understand how complex and hard it is, right? It's so true. <laughs> so here we make this stuff look so easy. And meanwhile, I think a lot of it is sweat blood on occasion because it's incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. And and so the expect we set a high bar of expectations. So I, I don't fault the clients necessarily for thinking something that really needs two weeks, they have three days for and a budget, you know, for one screen. It's up to us to really be clear about what information they give us and how we accomplish that and what it costs and how large our teams need to be. So, you know, I wanted bringing the community together just to talk about how to talk to our clients more effectively. So they, they understand well, when we turn around and ask for four times the budget they just offer a, offered us, they're not well, completely shocked. They're not, right? <laughs> they're not like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <sighs> This is ridiculous. Yeah, it's and I think that's fantastic because it's it's very very well needed, and it's definitely something that has um, not been spoken about very much. You know, like a, a lot of a lot of these conversations, definitely that I've been having have def there's been a, many conversations that I've had, even over the past couple of months that have um, all had kind of a, a backtone of educating cut clients and client expectations and being able to fulfill them, uh, not only in a timely manner, but also being paid for it. You know, um, one of the people I was speaking to said that, especially even now during this time, that this, the, this is the time that they've worked the most and gotten paid the least <laughs> over the course of the last few months. And I think a lot of, a lot of customers don't understand even the, like the amount of front end work that is done, Never mind, even like, Getting just getting the job and 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 uh, coming up with the concepts and the ideas and that sort of thing that is just not paid for. You know, it's just kind of an expectation of. Yeah, I I, I think I have a nice analogy for it that I try and use on occasion, and it, it's overly simplified. But if I gave any client, you know, a hammer, nail, nails, and some wood, that I can and said, build me a table, they would understand the physical and mental work that took. But if I gave them a computer and some 3D software and said, build me a table, I, I, there's no correlation in understanding yep. about the, the work it takes to understand the mechanics of how that goes. But they're, they're not ultimately that different. And if you're willing to pay a fine craftsman 
two thousand dollars for that table um there there are the same dis degrees of craft in building a virtual table and Absolutely. as such you know we need a better way to describe that to our clients yeah uh, so it's more respected yeah so is that kind of the general underlying um means and reasoning for for creating uh framework yeah at its basis it's a, a community building initiative we start by reaching out and touching you know all the teams who interact with that process of getting video to a screen in a live setting, whether it's installation work, um, uh, performance production, or now a virtual production, um, gathering that community, getting them to engage with each other to better understand how to present ourselves to the wider production community, whether that's other departments we interact with or our clients. Um, so in that way, it's, it's hopefully designed for our longevity by making us stronger as a community. So speaking of virtual production, I understand that the event's now been completely virtualized. Yes. So what have been some of your challenges in now moving from what was supposed to be a physical event over into a virtual event? So we were gonna have a physical conference in Los Angeles in October, and clearly that was scrapped. Um, Moving it virtual was a, a sudden brainstorm as I was starting to hear from peers about the, the stress of the pandemic. And now, as you described, that people were starting to work very, very hard and not see any money. They were pitching constantly, engaging their clients on these virtual technologies. I mean, we were on the cusp of so much great technology with XR and virtual stages, yep. I mean, um, smart stages. I would um, even and, say over the course of the last, sorry, I was just gonna say over the course of the last just a few months, it's been leaps and yeah. bounds. Yeah, and seeing some great engagement, hearing about productions um, that were using these stages. And I think there was already this awareness in the community that a lot of people had a learning curve ahead of them and there was some stress around that. And now suddenly we're in pandemic mode, no, nobody's working, but we all know what the potential is. And so there is this rush to refine and develop what we can do in a live setting virtually. Um, just you know, making this pivot with the skills we have into this working environment. Um, so I, I started hearing about or talking to people uh, in our community community that were working so hard, their clients were excited, but nobody was um, funding anything yet. Because uh, I think everyone, you know, anyone with some money to spend was waiting to see like just how serious this pandemic was, you know, I'm sure a lot of our clients were like, well, I just have to get through the summer. So maybe I don't want to make this massive investment. We'll be doing live shows in the fall. So there was, you know, this balancing of like, teams who could really show these incredible virtual production spaces and share them and were ready to go versus clients coming to them saying, this is fascinating, but you know what? I just really wanted a better Zoom experience. Yeah. And <laughs> Zoom's free, so or nearly free. So why, why does this cost as much or more than what I would pay your team to do a live event? So th there was this massive disconnect and I was talking to a lot of stressed out and tired people. And I thought, well, we need to be talking about this now as a wider community. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. So I, I knew there was incredible technology we could showcase in a virtual conference, but I didn't want that to be the focus. I wanted the community to be the focus and at least get us together online and talking to each other. So I had to um, really force myself to, to put that aside and just focus on, on the structure of, of talking to people, seeing what the session, the panel topic should be that would speak to where we are right now and what we're excited about right now. Because there were two things I wanted to address, just the wonder of the technology and where we could all take this in the future. And yep the wellness of our community and the stress we were under and, and just speak to both of those issues um, and how we're feeling right now. And that turned into eight sessions over two days. 
Um, we're keeping it uh, short and sweet to, you know, with the different panels, they're each only 30 minutes long, just so we can really cover these topics. And then my goal is to continue this discussion in a forum, introduce what I think are the are, are the real issues facing us right now moving forward in theme headings dealing with wellness, um, business, the future, and design. And then after this conference, hopefully there's motivation and uh, we'll be setting up a forum at our website so that we can carry these conversations in a forum environment and hopefully produce more of these online events for the future. I was just going to say, let me pop up that website now. For So for those of you who are interested in checking out Framework, uh, check it out at www.framework-community.com. Uh, I think definitely well worth your while. I think the, the four <laughs> topics that you just mentioned or uh, general topics that you just, just mentioned, Laura, definitely a, a winner without a doubt, a winning recipe. Sounds like it's going to taste really good. <laughs> I hope so. I hope it's engaging. I hope we hit all those like, you know, gut points that make you go, yes, yes, we're talking about these things um, and that we will continue talking about them. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. So um, in terms of the, the conference, for those who can't make it, like for me personally, I'm definitely going to be able to do Friday, but, you know, I have my daughter this weekend. So um, mm -hmm. my Saturday is going to be swallowed up, of course, by family time. Um, will people be able to access recordings of sessions after the fact, like after the, the, the conference? Absolutely. We hope the week after the conference, everything will be packaged and posted by session um, on the framework-community website. It will also be on Vimeo. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So for those that are going to be attending um, the conference, what if you could say maybe, I know this is kind of a loaded question, but what do you hope people are going to take away from it? And I know that we've already covered um, a good chunk of that, but in, in yeah. your feeling, what, what do you hope people are going to walk away from framework? Um, um, or, or I think primarily, I hope, I think primarily um, I want people to know they're, they're not struggling to find their way through this time alone. Um, they're, concerns and fears about moving forward, either into new technology or just getting by through the pandemic. Um, people are in this, this boat with them. Nobody has the magic answer of how we support um, all these production teams to get through this time. But I know that hearing each other and talking about it is an incredible comfort and understanding that if you're confused about um, how to get started in virtual production. E everybody's figuring this out. Nobody <laughs> was like jumping into the space 100% ready. We all have a learning curve to face. We're all experimenting. Um, and I think just the human factor of seeing, you know, top professionals talking about their uh, struggles, getting their projects off the ground, um, solutions they're finding, I hope people walk away inspired and emboldened to maybe finally open up that software or that uh, tutorial online they've been avoiding because they don't feel like they have necessarily what it takes. We're talking about a, a massive shift in the type of work we do. We're going to need a lot of people to do this work. So I want to encourage everyone to be educating themselves to move forward because when that moment hits that if it's not all virtual production, that there's always going to be some hybrid component of live and virtual that that there are going to be there's going to be a lot of work in this field. And we need to be educating and preparing ourselves for it. And this community will be, you know, outlining their own personal process of how they educated themselves to get ready for this and share that with with the community. It's been incredible seeing so many people doing tutorials, sharing their process online. Yeah. And we we don't want to be like the um, Reader's Digest version of it, but we do want to be the space where you can go and at least get some way to orient and figure out where you want to start in your own personal process of, of learning. Absolutely. I mean, I I think that's just fan absolutely fantastic. You know, that was, again, 
uh, talking to you early, speaking to you earlier about this, you know, one of the reasons why I kind of created this whole thing was to try and and show people that there there is good, there is light, there is a lot of things that you can do now, um, a lot of different wonderful tutorials that are out there. People are experimenting, people are trying new things, and it's wonderful to see how much progress has been made, even over such yeah. a short period of time. You know, it's it's yeah. pretty incredible. Um, some of the things that people are producing and uh, and people have been playing with. I'll just say as a reminder too, you know, there are a lot of people working in virtual production because they have um, the technology and um, the capital. There are a lot of Silicon Valley Silicon Valley companies in the gaming industry in um, other conference support services that are now exploring virtual events in their own way. And I just want to remind everyone, people with live events experience, people who understand space and theater and audience engagement, we're a special breed. And they may push their technologies to the forefront. I mean, I think some of the things happening in Fortnite are incredible, but we know entertainment and we know audiences and we have a lot of value in this space. And, yep. and I want to make sure that we're a part of this revolution. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt, because it's it's really about delivering really good content to the viewers and to the audience. And mm -hmm. technology is really just a means of being able to get it to them, to deliver it. It's, yeah. a, it's a delivery system that we're that we're working with. And in terms of virtual production, you know, we were already kind of rolling down that road before the whole pandemic hit anyway. There was a lot yeah. of progress that was being made um, with technologies like Unreal and uh, Unity and some of these gaming engines have already been kind of giving us a little nudge, uh, you know, in, into those worlds and and uh, giving us access to tools to be able to pull off things that were not physically possible in the past. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm truly excited to see where things are going to go in the coming few years. I mean, I think short term, uh, I, I couldn't even imagine long term right now, but short term, I think there's just going to be tremendous advancements and uh, some really amazing things that are going to come in the next few years. So I'm personally super excited to see what happens and see where we go. Yeah. I think about, um the conversations you and I had at SIGGRAPH when we started you know, exploring the intersection of our production work in the computer graphics community. And, and especially there was a kind of re-excitement about VR that was happening in that world. And I just remember being in that space thinking, you know, the film industry is really focused on VR, but this should be theater people driving the, this kind of storytelling if that makes sense, because it's like film thinks about controlling the audience experience by framing the shot and you put someone in VR and you create a storytelling experience or a theatrical experience. Like theater people understand space and yep. a way an audience engages with space and how to tell a story when there are multiple points of view. Um, so yes, I'm excited for this technology. I'm excited to see the way it intersects with the entertainment community and what we can bring to the table. Absolutely. So Laura, before I let you go, um, I know we've got like a little bit of time, just a few minutes left, but I wanted to speak to you a little bit about your book, which I actually yes. have right here. Awesome. Dink. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what stimulated to you to write it in the first place? Um, well, there wasn't a textbook that really addressed uh, the media operations community, the, the the programming community and the teams that were evolving around describing how to work with a content designer and cleanly, clearly get their designs to screen. And the textbook um, really wanted to follow the flow of um, Brad Schiller's lighting programming textbook and then Vicki Claiborne's yep. media server programming textbook for lighting programmers. I, I thought of it initially as the next step in the series. You know, okay, so you've learned programming. <laughs> now you want to be a better communicator to the people that you're interacting with 
since you've taken on media server programming? Because at least in America, that's how it evolved. A media server programmer eventually became the um, workflow engineer describing the whole process of you know, raster layouts, templating, um, content specifications, and, and certainly all of us developed our own process in communicating uh, delivery requirements to content teams. So the book outlines the process that evolved for me over years of working as a media server programmer, how I learned how to communicate with the content teams and the screens engineers, and really rethinking um, media server programming in a way that best supported the three teams as I saw them, design, operations, and engineering. And so that the workflow I, I created for my team was designed to work to the best skills of each of those departments and support their process and be a good communicator. Um, <laughs> so that that was really the motivation for the textbook is, is really talking about our our corner of the world and describing the workflow that I found best supported those three teams. Yeah, I found, I actually, I had some time to uh, to read through, I be completely honest, I haven't read the whole thing, but <laughs> I have, <laughs> it, there's some pretty heavy material in there. And, um, you know, for those of you that are watching and, and watching the episode, that it, it, you've put a lot of attention to detail. You know, I noticed that there's a lot of really thorough um, explanations on how things are done and uh, mm -hmm. and some of the processes of of what you go through, you know, in um, in pushing content from delivery to screen. Yeah. So. Well, it's a very um, intricate process, right? Because uh, at least in my broadcast work, rehearsal is such a stress point for someone in media programming or media server programming or anyone in that team on headset, listening to the demands of a director, of a producer, um, the way they think about screens control and what can be achieved. You know, they wanna re-deliver co content while a show is effectively live. You know, how do we manage all these expectations? And to me, it was setting out the process clearly to everyone from the beginning, whether it's what a file needs to look like to be accepted by the team, naming conventions, um, you know, a timeline for delivery, when I'm gonna stop taking deliveries, um, so that everybody kind of understood th the flow involved and um, the process. So it was clear because I figure if you give someone some structure, um, that leaves, you're filling in the vacuum, right? If, if I accommodate any request or any, any kind of idea without clearly stating someone described, I think Ash did about yes and, you know, I want to engage with my clients and um, the, the content teams and support them, but I also want them to re realize the impact of the request so they can make better informed choices. And I think that's a lot of what the book lays out is like the impact of, of everything we do, um, you know, and, and how this work has to come together. Sounds a little vague as I'm saying it right now, but I think the book <laughs> does a better job of, of clarifying. Well, I can assure that it's not vague inside your book. Okay, good. <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot of uh, extremely well-detailed information in this bad boy right here. And I felt bad because I didn't actually mention the name. <laughs> the name. The name of the book, for those of you watching, is Screens Producing and Media Operations. And I'm gonna throw up a little banner for you guys that are watching if you wanna check it out. So um, that's the website, www-mediaoperations.com to check it out. But Laura, I just wanna thank you so, so much for being a guest on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on thank with you. me today. Um, I wish you nothing but the best of luck in the upcoming convention this weekend. Um, again, for those of you who are who are viewing, I highly encourage you go and check it out. Um, it's definitely gonna be a, an event a lot of us are not gonna forget, I'm sure. And uh, I'm hope. looking, pardon? Let's hope. <laughs> well, with the speaker lineup and with the topics you're covering, I, I, I can't see how it's gonna go wrong. As I said earlier, it's gonna taste good. The recipe looks great. <laughs> I'm sure the meal is going to come out amazing. 
Excellent. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining me today. And of course, for you, for those of you watching, um, if you guys want to leave comments, questions um, in inside of the the post, we'll get those. We'll get to those as soon as we possibly can. And as I say all the time, stay ahead of the curve. <laughs>